A well-known feature of the Great Pyramid is the notch on the northeastern ridge. No one knows how old it is nor who made it. Could it have been created on purpose? Is it linked to the missing pyramid top in any way? Let's find out. For a while now, we've had some inklings about the Northeast Notch on the Great Pyramid. Before we got to proper research, History for Granite released a video on a related subject. This forced our hand. We decided to not sit on these ideas any longer and just put them out in the open to add to the topic, then move on. We recommend the History for Granite video, which is based on painstaking research, though it clearly doesn't need any extra recommendations. We'll first present our original inklings about the Notch, then we'll discuss how they relate to Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. Finally, we'll speculate how they may tie in with history for Granite's recent video. As always, we colorize and enhance old photos. If you want to see more videos, please like and subscribe. The Notch is an indented platform on the northeastern ridge of the Great Pyramid, about 270 feet from the ground. It's 18 feet wide and 20 feet tall. Behind the platform, accessed through a narrow gap, is a small cave. One graffito in the cave dates back to 1845. In one of our past videos, we showed the Egyptologist Bob Breyer in that cave, under a ceiling made of rubble. By the way, in a top-down view, the pattern of stones on the platform looks just as irregular. In 2013, the notch and the cave were 3D scanned. In 2017, the notch was used to test the muon detection by the Scan Pyramids project. Some time ago, we decided to track down the first mention of the notch. The earliest photo we could find that shows the notch is from 1857 by James Robertson. It's not the oldest photo of the pyramid, which is from 1839, but the oldest one doesn't show the notch clearly. Going further back in time, we only have drawings, but many were obviously made by people who'd never seen the pyramids. They just drew what they've imagined or heard, or whatever outlandish depiction would get attention. We have to select reliable depictions, like pairings, showing the notch in 1837. When we got back in time to Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798, we found a detailed image which shows individuals climbing the northeast ridge where the notch should be, but the notch isn't there. Another picture from the French description of Egypt shows some kind of damage, but not the notch in its current form. At that point an idea crossed our mind. Was the notch perhaps created on purpose by one of the fighting sides during a war? The scale of the notch seemed more than damage done by robbers or vandals, more like something done by military engineers or some such. Kinda like the gash in Menkara's pyramid, not made by a few robbers, but in a state-sponsored act ordered by a sultan. But why make the notch? The Nile Delta is a huge, low, flat plain. The pyramids were the tallest structure near Cairo until 1961. On a clear day, from the Great Pyramid, you can see almost the whole modern Cairo, not to mention the Cairo in late 1700s. By the way, today people associate pyramids with a flight to Cairo. But in the 19th century and earlier, Giza, Old Cairo, and the New Cairo, from which the modern city grew, were all separate locations. Returning to our train of thought. The view from the Great Pyramid gives you a strategic advantage if you want to track the movement of any military forces near Cairo. Let's explain the military situation in 1798. Egypt was part of the Ottoman Empire, but it was really ruled by the Mamluks. Mamluks descended from prisoners of war and slaves who converted to Islam and in time became a warrior class. Due to their military power, through the ages, they often fought with or even replaced the sultans. In 1798, Napoleon landed in Alexandria. He captured the city, then marched towards Cairo. The Mamluk army was commanded by two men, Ibrahim Bey and Murad Bey. The Mamluks set up their defenses near Mbebe, nine miles northwest of the pyramids, awaiting the French. Watching the approaching French army from the pyramids would certainly help the Mamluks. There's an illustration from 1880s called Egyptian Lookouts, which seems to show such use for observation. 
Note that telescopes were already in use back then. Napoleon defeated the Mamluks at the Battle of the Pyramids. After the battle, Ibrahim Bey fled east, Murad Bey fled south, the French moved into Giza. The situation has reversed. Now it would help the French to see the direction of the fleeing Mamluks from the pyramid. There's an engraving of French soldiers on top of the Great Pyramid. But the presence of Napoleon himself is likely false, as we'll see later. We know for sure that a group of French soldiers climbed to the summit because Napoleon ordered the French flag planted there. All this has led us to the thought that both the notch and the platform on top of the pyramid may have been created or enlarged to serve as an observation platform for some military force at some point in history. So by starting from the notch and following the idea of a military use, we arrived at a similar standpoint as history for granite, namely that the top platform and in our view also the notch may have been mostly shaped in one deliberate operation rather than slow, gradual vandalism over millennia. How could the notch be used as a military observation post? The spotter would hide behind a few blocks left on the edge. The clothes shown here are just an example. The spotter could be an Ottoman, Mamluk, a Frenchman, etc. From the early 17th century onwards, a telescope could be used. The post could work either short-term for a few hours or long-term for several days. For long-term use, the spotter could actually stay on the pyramid overnight. There could even be two men, in rotating shifts, one sleeping in the cave. Signaling could be done in a way concealed from other parties, such as mirrors aimed at a specific spot, or by positioning some large visible objects, like sheets of fabric or thin wood a certain way, etc. This way, the communication would be reserved only for those in the know. To bystanders, the notch would look like some random damage with debris, the post would be manned only during wartime, when needed. The reason for the location on the pyramid's northeast corner is clear. Starting with the Muslim conquest, Cairo has grown to the northeast, and that's where all major battles in history have taken place. Let's now cover issues that may pose problems for theories of the notch and the summit, being largely shaped in single deliberate acts, as opposed to gradual vandalism. How much of a problem these issues actually are is hard to tell, as their possible explanations are unverifiable. Let's start with the notch. Turns out Napoleon's 1798 invasion of Egypt can't be its origin. The Dane Frederick Norden already shows the notch in 1738. The earliest reference to it we could find is from 1720s by the Dutchman Johannes Egmond. Describing his ascent, he says that he rested halfway up the slope in what is translated as an inn probably something like a rest stop in the Dutch original. Eggman sounds like a diligent explorer. In describing the interior, he mentions the well and the so-called air shafts. Yet oddly, he doesn't mention the cave near the notch, which today is easy to see. It could mean that the cave either didn't exist yet in the 1720s or was hidden from view. Since the notch predates Napoleon in Egypt, does it quash the theory of the notch being made for military observation? Not quite. Almost three centuries earlier, there was another big battle near Cairo, the Battle of Redania in 1517. It's little known in the West, since it didn't involve Europeans. It was fought between the Sultan and the Mamluks. The location was east of Cairo, probably out of range of visibility from the pyramid. But this doesn't matter, since Mamluk spotters would have been looking out for the approaching Sultan's troops, regardless where the battle would ultimately occur. The reverse applies for the aftermath of the battle. Having won it, the Sultan hunted down the Mamluks inside Cairo. This time it was Sultan's spotters who could have been on the pyramid to identify Mamluk hideouts, which included Giza. The Mamluks were crushed. Their leader, Tumen Bey II, was hung from a city gate. There were even older big battles near Cairo during the Muslim conquest of Egypt, the siege of the Babylon fortress and the Battle of Heliopolis. But at that time the pyramid casing was still intact, and thus the notch, had it even existed back then, was not usable for observation. By the way, in old sources, you may see Cairo called Babylon. But Babylon was the name of Old Cairo, a town on the Nile, opposite from Giza. The modern Cairo grew out of a kernel to the north. The second possible problem is the graffiti on top of the pyramid. As History for Granite observed, in January 1799, the top of the pyramid was measured as much wider than just a year or so earlier. 
The problem is that the same document reports graffiti on top of the pyramid dating back to 1555. This of course is an issue. If a few layers had only recently been removed from the top platform, how can we see graffiti from 1555 there? It may be that one of the four men who measured the top platform during that crucial time was wrong. This seems unlikely, as they're all diligent, and the difference in measurement is large. On the other hand, we're not told where exactly that older graffiti was. The problem arises only if it had been on the newly exposed top surface, marked in red. It's not a problem if the graffiti had been elsewhere, marked in green. This may include the tops of the tallest blocks, which may have been accessible in the platform's previous state. There's certainly graffiti in these areas today. There's one point of disagreement with History for Granite, the motivation for this destructive act. History for Granite suggests that the top was enlarged in 1798 or so to give more room to the tourists. We choose to stick to our original reasoning, a military observation post. The tourist angle seems unlikely to us due to the Egyptian stance during Napoleon's invasion. Here's why. To gain support from Egyptians, Napoleon tried hard to express his respect for the Quran and to present himself as a liberator of Egyptians from Mamluk rule. The French organized public events that mixed the ideas of the French Revolution with quotes from the Quran. But the attitude of the Egyptians remained hostile. The Bedouins in the desert attacked French supply routes, caravans and garrisons in hit-and-run raids. In October 1798, an outright uprising erupted in Cairo. Members of Napoleon's staff were assassinated, and regular French soldiers were killed in the streets. Several thousand inhabitants of Cairo were killed during the suppression of the revolt. It's very unlikely that any Egyptian was concerned with Western tourists at that time. Besides the revolt, there's a second argument. Mass tourism to Egypt only began in the second half of the 19th century. That's why the Western visitors to pyramids prior to 1798 often published books, because hardly any other Westerner had a chance to get there. It was actually Napoleon's invasion itself, and the description of Egypt books, which ignited Egyptomania in the West. Mass tourism came only later, after the completion of the Suez Canal in 1869. To illustrate this, we found the dates for the most common old-timey photos of tourists on the Great Pyramid. They all date to 1880 or later, even though, as we've shown, the oldest photo of the pyramid was taken in 1839. Let's deal with two tall tales about Napoleon. No, Napoleon did not fire at the Sphinx, nor anything else. Frederick Norden shows the Sphinx without its nose already in 1740. The most commonly cited explanation is from the Arab historian Al-Markizi, who says a Sufi sheikh damaged the Sphinx's face out of religious zeal in 1378. But this story gets a bit muddled. Two Egyptologists refer to a possible disfigurement of the Sphinx as early as the 10th century, but they don't cite sources for this. Abd Latif praised the proportions of the Sphinx's nose around the year 1200, so presumably it was still intact then. I think there's good evidence that it was snapped off intentionally. There's a deep wedge down the bridge, and there's another groove in the Sphinx's left nostril. I think somebody might have pounded these metal wedges and then it snapped it off to the south. Another popular story says that Napoleon visited the king's chamber, told everyone to leave, then emerged after a while in a visibly shaken state and told everyone to never ask him about this experience. Except Napoleon never entered the pyramid. We know this because his secretary, Louis de Bourrienne, was with him that day and wrote down everything that happened. We'll finish this video with some trivia. Napoleon had a war horse called Marengo imported to France from Egypt. The horse was in many battles and was wounded eight times. Its skeleton is now on display at the National Army Museum in London. The first edition of the description of Egypt can sell for as much as a quarter million pounds. The plate folios can be one meter or three feet tall, so the full set requires its own furniture. During World War I, soldiers climbed to the top of the Great Pyramid with a telescope, but it was likely just for entertainment, not military observation. During World War II, Egyptian Air Force patrolled the pyramids. In 1944, there was an Allied camp near the pyramids. The Tura Quarry, which supplied the casing for the pyramids in ancient times, served as a military depot. 
Finally, the Sphinx's head was propped up, so the head wouldn't break off if it were to be hit. 